And welcome to another edition of Facebook Live. If you've been watching my promos uh, all week, you know that I have a special guest. Uh, honored, really, to, to have this person on. Somebody I've read about. And we're going to get into some of that. And we got a bonus also. We got an award-winning filmmaker who just happens to be her son. And even so, and look, every time I have one of my fraternity brothers on, I get complaints from alphas. I've had more alphas on than cues, so don't even go there. You know, uh, capitals, okay, capitals, I've only had a couple of you guys come on to do things. And uh, I've had a lot of signals on, so don't be saying, why do you always have cues on your show? I have, uh, I have all of them. And I did the count myself before I came on today. And for every cue I've had, I've had about three or four alphas come on to promote what they're doing. So there's the record straight and you're going to ride me. But I got a special show today. A couple of announcements. Just remember, Frank is Food Mart Northside, 1019 Preston Street. It's the Northside Co-op. We're trying to fill a food desert. You know, we're trying to go to the grocery store on the Northside that's been absent. So on Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., Visit Frankie's Food Mart. Good food, good healthy eating in our community. We need that going on and going forward. Also, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Omega South Five Fraternity for the big, big event we had this past weekend. A lot of community participation. So uh, thank you so much. Now, I'm not going to go along on announcements because I have a special guest. I have two special guests, actually. Uh, and <clears throat> we're going to talk to... Uh, my team here. Uh, I know the bros will be tuning in, uh, but I'm honored to have a guest like this because there are so many pioneers in the civil rights movement. And you read about them and you say, wonder if I ever got a, ever get a chance to talk to this person. Or I wonder if I ever get a chance to meet such a person. Well, an opportunity was presented to me by my frat brother. And once I knew I had a connection, I was I was like I'm going for this, him man. He's he, you know, I'm going for this, and he he's helped me out tremendously, and and got me to interview a person that I've known from historical from a historical context a long time, uh, in reading, and Miss Joan Trumpal Mahalan. How you doing? Got it right. Um, <laughs> I'm honored that you could say my name right. I'm doing fine, but it's just a little, little warm up here. I, I can understand that. He just said, and, and look, I've read enough about you and heard you speak enough that I know how to pronounce your name. So congratulations. So so it's like it's not like I found out about you yesterday and like, oh, let me go learn how to, you know, it's like I got it, you know. Uh the, the, some of the interviews I've seen of you, I, I, I don't like to ask questions over and over because let me ask you this question first. Do you ever get tired of being asked the same questions? No, I figure it's a learning opportunity for people, so I, I can do it. Because I know, because as, I, as I've seen you through the years, uh, CBS or some other documentary that I might be viewing, and incidentally, your son has an award-winning documentary on you. Uh, yeah, that boy outed me big time. <laughs> I know. And I, I want to get on him about it because I seen, <laughs> I seen both parts of your cool uh, interview that you did with Cool TV. So uh, I, I, I got a couple of questions for him also. Uh, but you took a courageous stance and Courageousness is, is, is celebrated in my community. Uh, tell the people, and I, I like the way you said people get a chance to learn, uh, some of the people, how did you yourself, growing up uh, in Washington, D.C., which at that time was considered a Southern city, it was a segregated city. Actually, uh, I grew up in Arlington, Virginia. Okay, which, Arlington, Virginia. Which was even more segregated than um, Washington, D.C. through my growing up, but. What impelled you 
to get into involved at a time when, I'm gonna be honest with you, there were a lot of black people afraid to get involved into the, in the civil rights movement because I grew up watching, there used to be a show that would come on called Huntley Breckley, the news. Oh, I remember. And we only had one station in this town. And my mom, used, this is how I learned about the movie. My mom would make me get in front of that TV and I hated the news because I wanted to, I was ready for the shows to come on, but she would make me watch Huntley Brinkley and there would be pictures of the Freedom Riders coming down south. Well, you probably saw me then. That's what I'm saying. You were on one of those buses. And I'm like, well, I know they're going to, what they're going to do to the Black people. I'm 9, 10, 11 years old. I know what they're going to do to the Black people, but they're going to treat the white people even worse. What made you get involved? How, what, what, what was the impetus for you getting involved in that? It all goes back to when I was about 10 years old visiting grandma down in the old company owned logging town, not the fancy resort, but the fallen downtown of Oconee, Georgia. It was just one dirt road with a train track running down the middle of the street. Train came through twice a day, rattling every house as it went. Train was named Nancy Hanks. Do you know who Nancy Hanks was? No, I don't. That was Abraham Lincoln's mama. So you mm -hmm. know a Yankee owned that train. Well, I had the same playmate every summer, a little girl named Mary, and we sort of dared each other to go down the other dirt road through the colored part of town, colored being the polite word, but it's not really the word we used. And so we snuck off and went where we were strictly forbidden to go. And people saw these two little white girls coming down the road. They had stopped sweeping their yards, just disappeared into or behind their houses. That was creepy. But then we got to the colored school it was a one-room shack, never had an ounce of paint on it. The door was ajar. You could see the pot-bellied stove for heat. There was um, no glass or screens in the windows, just wooden shutters, no electricity, no plumbing, a hand pump in the yard, and one outhouse way out in the field. And I knew out the other end of town was the fanciest building for miles and miles around, a brand new brick school for the white kids with indoor plumbing and electricity and all that fancy stuff. And I knew this was not right. It was not what we learned in Sunday school about treating people the way you want to be treated. Now this was all before Brown versus Board. And it wasn't loving your neighbor as yourself. I knew it was wrong. And I couldn't have put it in words then, but I sort of vowed that when I had the chance to make the South, didn't care about them Yankees, but to make the South the best it could be for everybody down here, I would seize the moment. And that came with the sit-ins when I was my freshman year in college. And then the um, Presbyterian chaplain, Mama insisted I go to Duke University because it was prestige and segregated, I'm sure. She didn't say the second part, but the Presbyterian chaplain there told us that next week, some students inv involved in the demonstrations in town were going to come and talk to us about, it, about them. Now, keep it quiet. The administration could lock us out of the building. The rowdies could show up caused a lot of bad trouble and the police could show up and arrest us. But these well-spoken, well-dressed students from North Carolina College, as it was then named, came and spoke to us about the demonstrations in legal and moral terms. And then lo and behold, they invited us to join them in the demonstration. So that led to, for a bunch of us to the picket lines, to the lunch counters twice, to the uh, city jail, to the courtroom, and uh, ultimately to the United States Supreme Court, which overturned the convictions. When you're on the buses and you're coming down south. When I was on an airplane, mm -hmm. um, we were trying to keep 
the police a little off guard about what direction people were coming, how they, you know, what they'd arrive in. And so I was with a group from Washington, D.C., and I claim full credit for getting my old friend Stokely Carmichael into the Deep South, causing good trouble. We flew from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, where the Freedom Rides were supposed to end, and then we took the Illinois Central, headed towards Chicago, and uh, got off in Jackson and walked into a waiting room together and took a seat, and Captain Ray told us to stand up and move on. Did you hear me? You yeah. gonna do it? He said, you're under arrest. So it was off to the county jail. No, off to the city jail first, and then the courtroom, then the county jail. And that got so crowded, it was Parchman Pen up in the Delta on death row. And, and this was before Strainy Goodman and Chambers, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that was, they weren't till 64. This was 61. And I knew Cheney and um, Schwerner. In fact, I'm the person who gave Schwerner and his wife their orientation session out at Tougaloo College, which is for Civil Rights Central for um, Mississippi. I gave them the orientation of what you need to know as a white person working for civil rights in Mississippi. And then when we'd be driving a civil rights folks over to Atlanta for say for a SNCC meeting or something, um, we could stop in Meridian at their office for a pit stop. And so I got to know Cheney that way too. You know, you know uh, Mississippi, from watching Mississippi as a kid on TV, and you would hear that word Mississippi. And, and my first duty station uh, was guess where? <laughs> oh Lord! It was Mississippi. And my mind, my mind went back to the Huntley Brinkley reports, and uh, it went back to uh, Emmett Till. Definitely, we it all did. Back, it went back to Schroeder, Government and Chambers, and I'm like, I'm getting stationed in Mississippi. Now the good news was that it was only seven weeks before they sent me overseas, but the bad news was it was Mississippi. And I was, I was like, I did not leave the base until it was time for me to transfer. So Mississippi struck fear. You know, North Carolina is the South, but Mississippi is a whole nother world. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you had, they put you on death row in Mississippi, didn't they? Well, they were just trying to frighten us. And they put the death row inmates out doing field work and they moved the Freedom Riders up there because it was... In the white women's cell, we were down to less than three square feet of floor space per prisoner. They had to do something with us, and they figured that was, you know, scare people. Didn't scare me. It was roomier, cleaner, and the food was way better. No added protein with the bugs, you know. And um, being part of their culture, I knew what their game was. So I wasn't scared. So, so you tell us about all this. That you were there, and, and, and you didn't, you didn't have, you didn't have fear that would be on, you know, dri driving through Mississippi from a duty station. I, I'm not gonna lie to you, Sister Joe. I was frightened my black behind off because the the older the older military black guys would tell you when you're going through the South, you don't look a white man in the eye. This this was in this was in the early. This was like '72. So, so, and this was like 10 years after you've been there and it was still there. Yeah. And they but, would tell me how to conduct yourself if you got stopped. And oddly enough, don't wear your uniform. And I said, how come I got? They said, don't wear your uniform. Now I thought being an American, that would be going my favor. I would have thought so, but nope. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah, I had to learn that too. And I'm like, well, wouldn't they say, say, well, he's an American? They don't think like that. Because he said there would be resentment. Well, the war wasn't over. The war wasn't over. It's still Vietnam, yeah. It's yeah, well, 
when we leave <laughs> Tougaloo campus, my sorority sister, often sometimes roommate, Joyce Ladner, she had a black scarf in her purse for me to put over my head over my hair anyway, because it was real blonde. And sometimes if we thought we might be being followed. I was on the floor of the car in the back seat with, uh, if there were anyone had a coat, it was thrown over me and their feet were on top of it. And, um, but we made it to Atlanta alive a few times. Did, but, did, 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 some of the, did, did the people who were with you, uh, and you had to hide. You had to hide in the seat because I, I could imagine how how they how they how they loved one red seeing you with this group of black people. Did your parents ever feel for your life? My daddy did. Mama just did, basically disowned me. I was such an embarrassment doing that. But she was from rural Georgia, and she was a product of her environment. Daddy totally supported. Um, my goals, the goals of the movement, but he was afraid his little girl was going to get seriously hurt. Now, let me tell you about my daddy. Another pop quiz. He was from a small town in southwest Iowa, and this was back, you know, the early 20s and all. Before planters peanuts and fresh produce year round, now the doctor's friend from his college days in Iowa would show up with pockets full of peanuts and he would just throw them out in the grass for the kids to have a scavenger hunt. He became the hero to every kid in this little town. Who was this guy with the peanuts? Come on, tell me. Uh, Jimmy Carter? This was when my daddy was a youngin, not when my son was a youngin. Okay, who was the guy with the peanuts? His first name was George. Washington Carver. You got it. That was my daddy's childhood hero because he had those peanuts. And so if you, you know, if you're a black guy as your childhood hero, you aren't prejudiced. Right. My parents had just agreed to disagree. They'd both come to D.C. for those good government jobs under Roosevelt and fell in love. And... So that's right, because George Washington Carver was in Iowa. Yes, yeah, where he went to school. He went to school at, yeah, he went, he went to school at the University of Iowa before he went down to Tuskegee. Yep. So that was my daddy's childhood hero. Love those peanuts. Wow. And so, and so, and so, you, 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 the, 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 the feel for. I know uh, you mentioned uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, early, earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, were you in SNCC? Were you in SNCC? I was in SNCC. Yeah, I was on the coordinating committee. I mean, you know, the inner council, and that's what got me to Mississippi. After the riots with Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes um, at, in Athens, Georgia, at the university, um, which is the next town down the road from where, where my mom was from on most maps, after those riots, I thought this is not integration, just a couple of colored students under court order going to a state school and being met with riots and tear gas and squad cars taking them off twice. If integration is real, it's got to be a two-way street. Hmm, maybe I should go to a colored school. So I didn't just up and apply. I talked it over with the SNCC leadership at the next conference, you know, fall conference thing. And the consensus was, that's a good idea. Nobody was against it. And then somebody said, well, if you're going to do it, you may as well go to Mississippi because those students haven't done anything yet, meaning sit-ins, and maybe you can help them get started. So I applied to Tougaloo. Then I got this letter. They had gotten my Duke University transcripts, but they hadn't heard from my high school. So I called up my high school in Fairfax County, Virginia, next county over from where I am now, and talked to the counselor, and she said, well, we aren't sending your transcripts to that school. 
and I knew exactly what she meant by that school. So I called Tougaloo and told them, and they knew exactly what she meant too. So they said, well, we'll accept you on your Duke transcripts. So I got in. Now let's fast forward 62 and some years. Loki had me on a Zoom thing with the superintendent of Alexandria Public Schools, the next place over from where I went to school. And he, well, he wasn't an Omega man. He was one of those alpha dudes but we'll forgive him. We'll forgive and, him for that, yeah. Yeah. And he said, Loki said, well, tell him about your transcript. So I did. And he said, well, I'll talk to my friend who is the superintendent of Fairfax County Schools. I'll get those transcripts sent for you. So 62 and a half years late, my transcripts from my high school arrived at Tougaloo College. Ain't that something? 62 years. <laughs> 62 and a half years late. That in itself is a story. <laughs> yeah, that's why I tell it. Uh, uh, now you want to uh, say something to get my son to run his mouth? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to ask, I want to ask Loki this. Uh, Brother Loki, when did you realize uh, uh, my sister was such an icon? He oh. made me an icon. Yeah, I made her an icon. No, no, he didn't. Uh, you made you an icon. He was he was there to report it, right? But but, but the stance you took and and the causes you took that that was all useless. But I want to ask Brother Loki that that question. When did you realize? Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean we um, you know we we knew about the photographs and such. I mean, and we knew some of the stories in general there'd be civil rights folks that come to the house. My mom had her scrapbooks and things, but it wasn't really until um, we saw the, the Jackson sit-in, the you know, famous one 60 years ago this year, um, where there's pouring the sugar on her head and everything. But that was, uh, when that showed up in the history books in high school, and I was like, why is, why is mom in a history book? <laughs> you know, it's like this was these were just these were just family photos, if you will. I, I can see that I can see that picture right uh, above your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean that picture is, is, is in every history book. Yeah. And every museum on civil rights. That's right. So it was just it was just mom and, and John and Annie, and you know, I mean, so and we, you know, Memphis isn't in the photo, but we knew Memphis and um so to us, it was just kind of more of that's what there's, you know, you, you have pictures of your, your of your parents' prom photos or whatever, high school photos and things. Yeah. These are my mom's, you know, photos. It just happened to be historical. Um, and so it was more of a kind of a fascination from that standpoint of seeing your parents when they're younger. Right. So, yeah, it was. That was just kind of the way things were for us. And then, when, but, but then once we had them in full context of history, um, then it was like, well, wait a second, there's, there's something else going on here. And then uh, uh, when, 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 when people first meet you, they, they probably meet you first as a guy who does film documentaries, right? They don't know your, your legacy or your, your lineage. And then they find out, wait a minute, uh, what's the reaction? Can I meet her? Uh, yeah, yeah, like the same the same ranch that I had. Huh? Yeah, no, I mean it, it, it's it's yeah, I mean there's uh it's it, it's a, there's a mixed reaction of sorts because there's some that are you know they actually are, are you know they they recognize my films right um, so that's a different level for some folks um, and then my mom because my mom only appears in two of my films but. Because of TikTok and stuff, I have her on that telling stories as well. So there's that element. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it's it's it, it helps get door get doors open when you need them in regards to like getting interviews and stuff. Because when I was doing an ordinary hero, for example, the film on my mom and the student movement, um, when I would call when I would call people or call museums or you know archives and stuff, you know the response was always oh, for Joan anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which kind of elevated that going why would they say that about her you know because she was one of thousands 
uh, and Luvon Brown, one of the Freedom Riders from Mississippi, um, who he's, you know, openly says, you know, you know, my mother was the first white woman he ever trusted with his life. Because, you know, he was uh, 11 years old when Emmett Till was killed. So, I mean, he knew uh, what white woman tears can get you. Um, and so uh, when, I to remember the point I was going to make about Luvon, but uh, that just escaped my mind. But anyways, you know, long, long story short <laughs> is, uh, well, no, no, so Levon says, you know, the difference is that, is that Jones stayed. Um, there were a lot of folks, right. white and black, who came down on the Freedom Rides and so forth, or would, you know, come down for some sort of event, but that was kind of their summer thing to do, you know, come and protest, and they'd go back home up north or wherever um, to, uh, you know, start school. But my mom and very few others actually stayed in the thick of it for that duration of time. It wasn't like everyone jumped in like John and, you know, John Lewis or and so forth and stayed with it. That was actually pretty rare. Um, people came in and out of different places right. lives. And so for someone like my mom who, who stuck with it, um, you know, I just... That was just a lot How of doing the film uh, on, on their hero. How was it working with your mom and and, and, and doing that film? And I, I and, and let me get to you about one of the things they asked you on the cool TV interview that I saw that you did. You said that every time you talked to your mom, you would find something new. Yeah. Like like you brought up an instance where the Baltimore incident where you had the autograph. Uh, uh, tell her, tell tell. I know the story, but I know the audience want to hear. But, uh, well, there's not an autograph in Baltimore. It was, there was, I, I, I'm trying to remember the story I actually told in that one, but but the long story short was, was my mom was talking about a, um, where she had got done a sit-in or gotten arrested in Baltimore. I'm like, when did you do a sit-in in Baltimore, right? Um, there was an, actually, after we finished the film, there was an article uh, about my mom, and they mentioned that she participated in the Summit of Montgomery March. And I said, well, mom, they got something wrong again. You know, she goes, oh, what did they get wrong this time? And I said, they said that you were in the Summit of Montgomery March. She said, well, I was. I'm like, oh, what? Why didn't she tell me that? Or she would just casually, like we were, actually, when we were shooting uh, An Ordinary Hero, we're walking on the campus, and she's kind of giving us this tour. This is not in the film. She's kind of giving us the lay of the land, because it's been, been a few years. And she's like, yeah, and that's where we had breakfast with Marlon Brando. I'm like, wait, what? You had breakfast with Marlon Brando? <laughs> you know? That's his mom. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, 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 I thought that was an interesting story that you, you recognize the handwriting, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, that's what it was. So you were sitting at a mass meeting afterwards, mom, or something at some event, no, some event, Years later, and this guy hands you over this note, and he said, "Do you recognize his handwriting?" You, yeah, that's mine. And this was a note you guys. That had was up in Baltimore. That was up in Baltimore. Yeah, tell the story, Mom. Um, we had been sitting in at the lunch counter, and I'm not sure I remember it all, but um, and he, we talked about going out to dinner afterwards, but we got arrested. I'm, Correct me if I mess That's it up. Right. That's right. That's yeah. right. And um, yeah, I remember that. I can't remember what his name was, but I said, well, I'm still ready to go out to dinner. <laughs> Something like that. But he had kept it all these years. Yes. I mean, this was over 50 years later, maybe. Wow. 55 years later, he still had this little notepad. It had other notes, you know, in it from... From that sit-in and all that, but I, I got a message up on the chat chat board from one of your Saras. Sarah Joan, it is a joy to hear you sharing your incredible story. Thank you for your commitment to civil rights and our beloved sorority. Assigned Miss Epsi Kirk. And that's one of your Saras. That's so thank you, Soror. Yep. <laughs> Now, the best sit-in I was ever in, it was at the Tottle House near the SNCC headquarters in um, Atlanta. And there I was sitting at a table with Dick Gregory. And uh, he remembered that years later. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, you know what, when I, was, when I was in college, 
uh, and I went to the University of North Carolina yes. at Wilmington. Yes, he yes, was a speaker, did. and I had to pick him up. My job was to pick him up from the airport. So we go to the to the Wilmington Airport and pick up Dick Gregory. And he, this was in 1980. And he says, I got to stop and get my vegetables. And he was walking around the store picking up all kinds of fruit, you know, just picking up fruit. And nobody realized this is Dick Gregory. <laughs> you know, he's just walking around like an ordinary person. Uh, but he was a, but the, the man could speak literally for hours and hours. Oh, yeah. Let me let me ask you this here, and I want to say hello to my another friend that's joining us, Donna. How you doing, John, Donna? Extremely interesting guests. Yes, they are. But I want to ask uh, Sister Joan this: You're at the oh. lunch counter with this iconic photo that every that's been seen all over the world, and 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 these white people come; they're pouring stuff all over your your head yeah. and stuff. You weren't wasting scared? all that sugar like I wasn't sweet enough already. But hey. <laughs> What was going through your mind then when they're, when they're doing this? You know, I mean, you're sitting at the lunch counter and these, I mean, the, the pictures that even to see to this day are frightening. Well, I think by then I was into sort of an out of body experience, like the real me had left the shell of a physical body. And it was like a the real me was a guardian angel up above, sort of protecting me a bit. Um, but we were cracking jokes. Sometimes we were holding hands and praying or um, hassling Professor Salter about he hadn't really covered all that material that was on his final exam. He hadn't really talked about that in class or anything. But we were making the most of it. And I always say, it's, if you go, we're all going to die someday. It's better to die for a cause you believe in than trying to cross the street at rush hour, even when you have the light. And um, I don't, in a lot of ways, I don't blame the kids. They were a product of their environment. If they were, the high school was just a couple blocks away. If they had good grades and were upperclassmen, they could leave and come uptown. This was their big day. And they could get lunch uptown. This was before the fast foods. They came to the lunch counter, but it was closed because we were sitting there and they were not happy about missing out on their big day and being hungry. So they started hassling us and um, they were sort of out trying to outdo each other. But. Wow. I, I want to go back to my frat brother for a minute. Well, yeah, please do. A few, <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> when you when you see when you see these photos and you, and you you know and you look back, what's your you know and they're doing all they calling your mom all these names and she's and and her life is in jeopardy. What goes through your mind? Well, first I'm glad she made it. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, a little, little self serving. Um. Uh, you know, I I think, you know, it, it's interesting. I remember um, the first time I met Ruby Bridges and my mother and, and Ruby were receiving an award together at the uh, National Civil Rights Museum. And I, I I said to Ruby, I said, you know, there's, there's two photos that have always struck me uh, where I felt like I wanted to, to go in and protect that person. You know, one was the sit-in photo of my mother and the other was Ruby. Right. Um, so that's kind of what would always kind of come to my mind, when, you know, at, at, to that point. Um, and then Ruby had said, you know, your mom's a national treasure. You know, take mm -hmm. care of her. Um, you know, the only thing you can say to Ruby at that point is, you know, yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, and see, mom, I, I did learn. Yes, ma'am. You see that, mom? I can say yes, ma'am. Um, Glad you learned something. Yeah. But then, <laughs> you, you know, the. The further, um, the, the more I've been around the image and been around the stories and so forth, it's there's there's a different level of appreciation um, of what these handful of individuals, 14 people in all did. Um, and just uh, the audacity 
to think they could change, help change the world. Uh, and, and just the, the courage to step beyond and, and be willing to do it, um, to put it on the line. And that just a handful of people can make such a huge difference. There's probably 180 million people in the country at that time. And mm -hmm. yet it only took 14 at that lunch counter. And you go, well, it didn't change the whole whole U.S. or anything. It's like, okay, well, let's just talk about Mississippi. It was the population of what, uh, you know, one, one point, you know, two million, one point four million, fourteen people. You know, I mean, it's not even a percentage point. Uh, makes such a huge dynamic shift um, for the betterment of everybody. Uh, and then just the flat out, you know, courage, like I said before. Um, I, it, I get people all the time. I would have sat there right with her. I'm like, I want it. I like to think I would, but I, I don't think I could have. You know, you know, the late John McCain uh, uh, was a, a, a Navy pilot that was in, uh, he was a POW for yeah. seven and a half years. In fact, I was in the Philippines when he got released from prison. Hmm. But, uh, but he said, they asked him who he admired. And he said, the person I admire most, John Lewis. And they said, wow. and he said, what I did, uh, okay, yeah, I, I spent seven, seven years in a, and in, in, we used to call it the Hanoi Hill. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I spent seven years in the Hanoi Hill. But what John Lewis did, and he was a big fan of John Lewis. He said, what John Lewis did, he, and he would tell his children about John Lewis was something that was, that you, could, you can't describe it because it was so horrific, you know, what this man went through. Uh, and I'm like, man, you know, having been in the military and, and, and knowing guys who were at the Hanoi Hill, I'm like, you know, that's, that's saying a lot, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but when you think about it, uh, those people were brave. I mean, you've seen the burning buses, uh, Aniston. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's the courage it took, and that's why I was I was I was telling Sister Joan, uh, you probably, you know, we, we we used to have a thing that we we're too, you know, uh, war is a young man's game because they're too stupid to know any better. <laughs> so, so I guess your youth, uh, Sister Joan, sort of insulated you from that fear factor because growing up. My, especially my mom, she would tell me, you know, I'm scared when you go out there, though. Uh, you know, uh, and then you'd always hear the story of Emmett Till. Well, sadly, we still have parents who have to say that today. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to ask you about that, Brother Loki. Uh, being a historian and a documentarian, uh, how it seems to me, my wife and I were discussing it last night, and we've come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, the stuff your mom fought for, I mean, now, brother, I've seen, I seen some of your interviews, so I want to get your uh, view on this. They come up, they don't use the N-word anymore. Oh, sure they do. <laughs> it's not well, well, they, don't use it at, they don't use it in public. Now, right, uh, right. now, your mom can remember people like Wallace and Billboard and Oval Forbes. They would use it in public. But now what they do is they use words like woke. Yeah. The RT. And it's it's the same thing. Your 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 response. Yeah, no, we I mean, obviously we haven't rolled back completely. I mean, have we made progress? Yes, of course. I mean, we don't have slavery, modern, you know, chattel slavery, let me phrase that. We don't have, you know, legal segregation. And although we still actually do have slavery on the in our constitution, mind you, but um, but we don't have Jim Crow and segregation and, and, the, and the traditional forms that we remember it as. Um, but the foundation of racism still exists. Uh, the lessons are still being taught. Those those quiet conversation, those those racist jokes, the the stereotypes persist. That's why, you know. A black guy can be fishing in his own neighborhood and get stopped three times. I mean, that was just recently just happened. Um, you know, it's it's the the grief. You know, walking while black, right? Um, 
you name it while black and something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, it's the policing of black bodies, uh, the rollback of, of voting rights and so forth. Um, and while we definitely have seen this manifestation, we've definitely have seen the empowerment, this, this, uh, this sense that um, it's okay, you know, that, that, they, that, that politicians have their back. Um, we're also seeing what we saw in the civil rights movement. We're seeing people who, like Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer said, are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and are actually doing something about it. Who are raising their voices? Who are out there, um, you know, in on social media, in person, doing the work, you know, everything. Uh, there's a gentleman, Ernest Krim III, who's uh, got a book called "Black History Saved My Life," and he's out there speaking and doing great work. There's a group that's called. Um, the uh, a long talk about the uncomfortable truth about they they speak at all these universities and organizations about you know the history of institutional racism uh it's it's always about telling the truth and we know back in you know since they rewrote the history books up until just recently until they try to rewrite them back you know the the history of slavery and uh was rewritten the history of jim crow is being rewritten right um that the truth is what allowed that to foster, you know, fester. And that's what that's why it's festering now. But we're also fighting back with the truth. We're having this conversation right now, uh, dispelling these myths. The thing I feel most is, uh, and I express it all the time to young people, is that uh, people like Sister Joan, uh, people like, and you mentioned Fatty Lohema, Ella Baker. Uh, uh, is Diane Nash still living, Sister Joan? Mm -hmm. She's still with us. She's still with us. Yep. Yep. Okay. And people like that, that the legacy is lost. Uh, I don't see the same. And I could be wrong. It could be me just getting over, but I don't see that fire because uh, you said in one of your interviews, Brother Loki, that you were living in Utah and you weren't going to vote. And your mom told you she didn't ride that bus. <laughs> or she didn't go to, she didn't sit at that lunch counter to take abuse for you not to, to vote. Now, oh, no, it was, it, was, it was more blunt than that, you know, because uh, this was Obama's second term. I mean, it's a super red state. And I was like, you know, my vote doesn't matter anyways here, so why would I bother? And she said, well, my friends died so you can vote. I mean, that's, pretty blunt, that's, that's the end of discussion right there. Yeah. And, and so, and, and so, and so, and so my concern in reference to that is that I, I'm out there every day talking to young people and they don't have that interest. Now, now I'm not I'm not making a blanket statement. No, of course. Because, not. You know, but too many coming up. I used to, like I like I said earlier in the show, and uh sister Elsie up there, uh Miss Jones Sorrow, we're from the same hometown, uh young people. Were forced to vote because you tell know I me mean? you were forced to learn what was going on. Right. You know, you had you had to know what was, you know, you know when Kennedy got shot. You know when uh things that were happening, uh you knew the bad people. Uh Sister Joan, you went to Duke uh for a year, I understand. Mama insisted, wasn't where I wanted to go. And see, when you were up in Duke, that was a man that used to come on TV in Raleigh. You might remember, and his name was Jesse Helms. I've heard that name. <laughs> and Jesse Helms, used to, he was a commentator. And Jesse Helms would actually come on, because in Wilmington, we had a, a man named Ben McDonald. They were like mirrors of each other, you know. They would give the most racist of uh, commentaries using the n-word on tv mm -hmm. you know so uh, young people i think that they too many of us like uh and you can look at the, the voting numbers and, and the data and show you that wait a minute something's going wrong these guys who rode the freedom buses the marches and uh you can go even you go further back than that uh to the tuskegee airmen and, and uh all the historical figures that fought for our right. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of 
we, we're not appreciating it like we used to. I talk to young people about voting. They say, don't do any good. Mm -hmm. uh, let me read this for Sister Joan. Uh, Miss Carrie, how you doing, Sister uh, uh, Carrie? Good to see you. Respect. Thank you, Miss Dallison, for having these courageous guests on today. Mrs. Mahalan, thank you for standing up. Thank you for passing the baton and sharing your stories of truth as you live with your as you lived it with your son. You must never be fearful about what you're doing when it is right. And that's a, a quote from Harry Belafonte. Wow. Yeah. You know, my mom and I were speaking in Mississippi, you know, it was probably back in 2018. Um, All back, yeah. To, to a group. And um, one of the students, high school students said, well, you know, why should I vote? My vote doesn't matter. You know, same thing I had said, right, to my mother. And I said to him, I said, your vote matters so much they're doing everything they can to take it away. Um, the what informs, but the why transforms. And so it's not enough just to say, you know, you need to vote. It's the, it's the why behind it in, in particular, and not just the mere why of like, well, because it's democracy and that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, that's what they hear. But to understand uh, the impact of voting, to understand, um, you know, again, it's like, Hey, look, you know, they're, they're trying to take this right away from you because they know why, you know, what that does. And they can't really take it away like they had years ago, but they can put up enough roadblocks to frustrate you to the point yeah. where you don't even want to show up. Right. Uh, that you think things can't change. I'm just glad that, you know, people like Harry Balafonte and my mom and others were, you know, were dumb enough to think that they could end Jim Crow and segregation. Just, you know, when everyone else was like, this is the way things are. Nope, they, they, they had something in their head that just said, no, this is not the way things should be because, you know, we're gonna make it the way we want it to be or the way it needs to be based on what our founding principles say that we are, based on what the scriptures say who we are. And so they set about doing it. So things can change. Sister Joan, I heard you say earlier, and you made reference to when you first went down to Georgia uh, to a family, uh, to visit family, and you saw how Black people were being treated, and you said, this is not what's in the Bible, or this is not what I learned in Sunday school. Did you make the connection between uh, uh, religion and uh, what, what you were actually seeing? Yeah. I think so. I had been sort of oblivious to things, you know, as a young kid up until th that event in Georgia, but I definitely made the connection right there and continued to. Why, why, do, why do so many people connect? They, they, they use religion and, and to, to, there was a time in my life when I thought that there was too much bigotry in religion. And you see it today. Uh, Brother Loki know, 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 knows it, uh, being out there, uh, that uh, you went down and your life was threatened and you were thrown in jail. Uh, you know, the funny, and a side note, it's not funny, but you were actually, even in jail, you were segregated <laughs> from, from. Oh, yeah. Over. We we were, the the cells were segregated by sex and race, but the cell block, it could be a white cell and then two black cells and a white cell. We were all a lot closer then. And when it came time, the rabbi, just to mix it up more, came up every week from Jackson same narrow two-lane road to get there before the interstates. How he didn't get killed is still beyond me. But they would call out, um, the wardens would call out, if you want to come pray with the rabbi, call out your cell number. And praying with the rabbi, and there was a lot of anti-Jewish feeling in the state, praying with the rabbi, we were an integrated group. And then... And he would talk with us, not just pray, but talk and messages from home and 
anything we wanted to tell our parents, make a little note. And then after this little integrated gathering, we went back to our segregation. I mean, just and yet, crazy. Out, and yet outside of prison, you couldn't integrate a church. No. Yeah, right. That's... I mean, right? Not unless you wanted to go to jail. No, well, sure. we the, the white folks went to the black churches, the civil rights workers. Right. And we didn't we didn't get a hassle that way. But we had at the white churches in town, we had pray-ins. Yeah. We we went in an integrated group trying to go into worship. Um they wouldn't let us in except for the Catholics. And I think one other church was okay with it. And um so we would kneel on the steps of the church and pray and get arrested sometimes. How many times did you go to jail? Um, I think six. Now comes the question of being held in contempt of court in a cell, but not booked. That doesn't count as an arrest, or maybe it does, but it's about half a dozen, twice in Durham, um, twice in Mississippi, once in Baltimore, and then I was held in contempt of court in Baton Rouge for sitting in the wrong side of the courtroom. But weren't you held in, in Rock Hill for your safety? Well, I wasn't put in a cell. Oh, okay. I was put in a squad car and we were picketing downtown in sympathy with the um, students who were involved in the jail in down there and things were beginning to get a little rough and the police put me in a squad car and took me to police headquarters but i was not booked or put in a cell and i think they were taking me in protective custody that little white girl thing but it went out on the wire services that i had been arrested when they saw me put in the squad car brother loki it's just mom <laughs> let, me, let me ask my brother something. Uh, right. You, you, ordinary, ordinary heroes about your mom. Uh, <laughs> how was it really? You know, my mom passed away in 2018. She lived alone and good life, and, mm. and she passed away. But I could imagine, and and my mom was, was active in the civil rights movement. Uh, and she got me involved in, in, you know, that's that's that was the lady that used to sit me down in front of the TV and say, watch right. yeah. the Brinkley. And you would see the, the Freedom Riders and all of that going on. But it had to be somewhat intimidating. And I'm asking you, was it to do to uh, do her? You won an award, so obviously something went right. Uh, but how intimidating was it to do a do a, a feature? On this, on this lady, um, about as intimidating as it was to do uh, Mrs. Evers. <laughs> I mean, us old ladies are intimidating. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a documentary called The Evers. You know, she's ninety years old now. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, no, she's. So we we did. A, I did a documentary with her, uh, her and her daughter. Um, it's and you can find it on Showtime called The Evers. Um, no, it was it was not so much intimidating with my mom as just kind of uh, initially just kind of awkward. Because, you know, it wasn't like we had these extensive conversations about the civil rights movement. Um, and my mom is very coy. And she's only going to tell you what you, you know, what you ask for. And you have to know how to ask it. Uh, I, it was it was fortuitous that she was one of the last interviews I did because I knew that there was at that point, there was interviews that if I, if I hadn't done those first, like Ed King, for example, um, the information I got from him that I could use with the interview with my mom, that it would have never come up. And so um, I was able to piece together a lot of different things, you know, parts of the stories that um, otherwise would not have had it. And, you know, as ammunition. You know, and obviously, for example, the Selma Montgomery March is one of those things where it just became, 
you know, that, I only learned about that years later. What is it about Sister Joan, Brother Loki, that we see, we see her in the pictures, we see that photo of, uh, and I'll go back to it again, um, she's at the lunch counter and they're pouring with, with the other Black students and they're, they're just, you know, well, you see them up there. Uh, but what is it that we, that we don't quite get about her, you know, that we, that you don't think the public gets? Um, I, I think the thing people miss the most, and, and this is a problem that you have when you start talking about people like my mom. Um, you know, there's movies and there's books and these, these pictures and it's larger than life um, that we start, we start to create gods. Um, and we then we can't see ourselves, you know, being that person. And, and my mom, there's a reason why it was called an ordinary hero. She's literally, you know, she said, I'm as ordinary as they come. She said, I saw something was wrong and decided to do something about it. It just takes each of us to make that choice. Um, and she just chose a Southern way of life, you know, that she was going to end segregation. Um, that, that really each of us have that capacity and that there's no, there's no superhero, you know, magic formula. Um, it's, it's just as Luvon Brown, you know, said, you know, just, she chose the courage of her convictions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do a cheap plug here on that. Um, so that was one of the things, the reasons I, I did the book, Get Back to the Counter, mm -hmm. Seven Lessons. And it's here's these seven different lessons or principles um, that really kind of outline what it took to, to be a Joan, what, you know, what she did. And you get, you get those lessons and they're embodied in these different civil rights stories that we have from her. Um, but there's a, there's a particular quote in here that I always like. And um, I have to turn to it, but uh, I hope you got it accurate. It's accurate. It says, <laughs> what made me do it? Well, I've either been blessed or cursed with excessive determination. You know? Yeah. Um, but we need to have that excessive determination, that, that fire to you know, keep our you know, eyes front, head high to the finish. You know, that we, you know, we need to see it through. Let's see it through. <laughs> I'm waiting for you. <laughs> you got it in. You got, yeah, got it in. You got it in. You got it in. Oh, man. 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 Uh, you can let everybody know. And let me say one thing about your Sora, who's up, who's still up there on the board. The reason uh, uh, Elsa and I, uh, 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 she's uh, her father uh, started the Father Curtin started the first black. He was an Episcopalian priest. Started the first black summer camp on the beach here. You know, Wilmington is the beach. Mm -hmm. and, and we know the ocean segregated. That water is all segregated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he had the first black camp, but mm -hmm. so, but, but we were Facebook friends, and I was I commented uh, about the, something about Sister Joan came on, and I commented, "Man, I admire this." And she said, "Her son is one of your brothers." Oh, right on. And I said, "What?" <laughs> And so I immediately go, I'm like, yeah, so out of the blue, uh, and I'm saying this because we near the end of the show. So out of the blue, I'm like, I'm going to send this guy a message. And I know you get a lot of messages, Brother Logan, mm -hmm. but I know I, I would put something in there that you would respond to, and we're not going to go into all of that. You know yeah. what it is. Yeah. And I put something in the message because he, because I know you requested for a lot of airtime for your mom and all of that, but I put something in there that you responded to. And before I could get back to my den, you called me. And that's, and that's, and that's where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sister Joan, we could spend hours and hours talking, but I want to thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for being who you are 
and for making life better for a lot of people. Did you know John Lewis? Oh yeah, John was my hug man. Cause you know, Southern gentlemen always hug. Uh -huh. Every time I saw John, I got a hug. Congressional hearing, big fundraising dinner, um, where he was the main speaker or when he was giving the keynote address at a national conference. If I saw John, I got my hug. Now that I can, last time I saw him was on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now that he's gone and can't hug me on this earth, Benny Thompson, who graduated from my same college, he's, he's my hug man. Now I got something I want to tell you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Your mama made you watch the news. Made me watch Huntley Brinkley. I only had one station back then now. <laughs> yeah, but now we had more than that. Now my five sons, between them, they could only watch, was it, I forget if it was one or two of that canned laughter show a night. I think it was probably one, but they could watch all the news programs they wanted. And I'd be coming down the stairs to where the TV was and I'd hear click, click, click as they were turned back in the old TVs as they were switching channels to the news before mama caught them. But <laughs> I think us old ladies were caught cut from the same fine cloth. That's Watch right, TV. that's right. Find out what's going on. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. Brother Loki, uh, you got to come back on so we can talk some more. We, you know, we got some real heavy stuff to talk about, bro. No, for sure, team. Okay, all right. Sister Joan, God bless you. Man, bless you. And thank you for having us. Y'all stay safe. And glad the audience joined. We will be reposting. This is... Uh, been one of the big moments, you know, I started doing this, uh, I was on the radio and I started doing this Facebook page in 2015. Uh, and so this is one of the big moments. This is one of those moments that's a barometer, it's a, it's a threshold. Mm. So I want to thank you, brother, for doing this for me. Uh, as we say, I owe you why. Everybody, thank you, my producer, brother J.D. Wade. Everybody be careful. See you Friday. And uh, anytime, anytime, sister, you want to come on, you're welcome. But I know my, my team will be back on because we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Take care, everybody. Take care and get in good mm -hmm. trouble. <laughs> I will do.